we call these troublemaker trainings because I started organizing in my pretty conservative community north of Cincinnati after the 2016 election. And a lot of elected officials had never been challenged before in my city and they did not really like it. Um, and they started calling us troublemakers on the record. And so that is why we adopted the name and took it on as a badge of honor because we wanna make sure that all of you can be troublemakers in your community basically stand up for yourself, use your voice and really fight for the issues that you care about. So we know that like these right wing culture wars are never ending, right? Because this is there, they adopt and they grow because it's a tactic to turn out voters um, and to push a political agenda. So we saw, you know, the anti CRT and the COVID and the mask issues. And now it's book bans and attacks on sex ed and attacks on LBGTQ youth plus youth. Um, so it's kind of a never ending cycle and it's not going to go away. So we definitely need to be informed and we need to know how to stand up and fight back on this stuff. So we, um, before I ever get started, I like to say one thing is that women in particular sometimes tend to question their ability. You know, you have to be asked to run for office like seven times before you do it. Um, so I want to always just say, you can organize, you can start something, you can do this. So please don't question your ability. You don't have to know everything about every issue. You just have to care and want to make a difference. And I promise you that you can do it. Um, so I'm going to click over to the next screen now. All right. So build it and they will come. What do I mean by that? I mean, please do not get bogged down with like, oh my gosh, I only know a couple of people who feel like me. I don't think I can get people together. I don't think I can bring people in my community to go to a school board meeting or any kind of meeting or stand up and organize around an issue. I guarantee you will. <laughs> just start with who you know. So even if it's just one or two people, don't get overwhelmed by numbers because the people, you start a Facebook group or something of that nature, you add the people you know, they add people they know, and they grow. So the group that I started here in the Cincinnati area, we started with about 12 people. We have 750 people in there now. Our national Facebook group Sweep was started by a woman on, the, on a whim in Kentucky one night when she got mad that Trump was tweeting about suburban housewives. She started a group called Suburban Housewives Against Trump. It grew out of control to the point that she really couldn't manage it anymore. And we had met her and we started helping. There's now 220,000 women in there. So these things grow on their own. I have never met a woman or a person who came through this training who told me, I tried to start a group and it just didn't take off. Just doesn't happen. People know people and it will grow. So just build it and they will come. All right. But what do you need to think about? So there's something going on at your school, there's an issue you care about, you want to get people organized. So what are some of the things you need to think through to do that? So the first step is communication, right? You got to have a way to talk to each other. Um, and the easiest thing is to meet people where they are. So lots of people are on social media. Um, I know different ages are on different types of social media. I will say that for organizing, Facebook is actually a pretty good place to go. Um, I know we all have our issues with Mark Zuckerberg and how things are handled, but it's a very low barrier to entry because a lot of people are already on there. You don't have to go to an event. You don't have to sign up for anything. You just click join a group um, and then you're in there and you're meeting people and you're part of a community and you're having conversations. So it's a good way to build relationships. But it's not the only way, you know, you could just do an email list. You could just grow an email list serve and like engage that way. I've met some women um, who lived in a retirement community and that was how they did it because their community really wasn't big on social media. But there's also things like Slack or WhatsApp or Signal. There's all kinds of ways that you can communicate now. So it's really just determining what do you think is going to work best for the group of people that you're trying to bring together. But think through all of your options. And then the next thing to think about is setting your parameters and your focus, okay? Because <laughs> you want to know what are we working on, what are we working towards, and who is going to be part of this group? Because if you just open it up to anybody, you won't really have any control, nor will you have a focus, and it'll just become unwieldy, and it really probably will not bring about any results. So what's your focus? School board issues? Um, things going on in general in your community that you want to address, like supporting candidates that you care about for elections. Um, who's allowed in this group? Is it only for a certain political party? Is it open to independence? Um, is it open to anybody who shares your values, no matter their political affiliation? So think that through as well. Is it just for people in your city or your school district or your county? Like how far afield do you want to get? 
we keep mine just to my city because we want to we want to focus on issues where we live. And if it gets too far afield, you know, we would we would lose that focus. There'd be too many things to concentrate on. Um, it is much easier to establish these parameters and enforce them than it is to start aware, you know, free for all and then try to pull it back. Um, and people will challenge you on this. So please make those decisions and stick by them. I always have people who are like, my sister lives really close by. Can't she join this group? And I'm like, no, I'm sorry. Because she lives in a different city with a different school board and a different mayor. And we have different issues. You know, we so we enforce that rule. Then the other thing that is one of the most important rules of all of this is you need to make it social, okay? Almost every grassroots women-led group that I have spoken to had kind of the same story after 2016. I got pissed. I got together with friends over a glass of wine and we decided we had to do something. But the reason they kept doing it and the reason they kept coming back was because they you know, had friendships, they built friendships because it's not just all work, work, work. You have to have some fun with this. So um, there has to be a social component. That's why we're red, wine, and blue. The wine is a metaphor for the social aspect of stuff. Um, so go out after a school board meeting, go get a couple of drinks, do a planning session over dinner. If you're running a Zoom meeting, they can still be fun. You can have icebreakers. Um, you know, you can celebrate people's wins. Somebody gave an amazing speech at school board. Let's celebrate them. Like you can make it fun but it's definitely something that you have to do. And the last thing that's important to keep in mind is you have to delegate. So when you have an action, you're going to a school board, they're trying to ban books, you're gonna to go to the school board meeting, you need to figure out who's speaking, who's gonna make sure we have this done. You gotta figure out what are all the actions you need to take and then delegate them to people, okay? Um, if you don't, you can't take it all on. And I know there's probably some micromanagers in the crowd who are type A and wanna do it all. But that also doesn't involve people. People are going to feel more invested if they contribute. And everybody who comes into this group, you will be surprised that you will find people have different skill sets. Someone's really good at social media. Someone can create graphics. Someone knows how to do like amazing speech writing. Um, someone's just a you know fabulous communicator or they have good accounting skills and they want to help collect money. You will find people's skill sets take advantage of them. And please do not be afraid to ask. That was one of the things that I learned the hard way is you feel like you're imposing, you're not. People are flattered to be asked, hey, I think you'd be great at this. Oh my gosh, I could really use your help. Would you mind? The worst they can say is, you know, I don't think I can take that on, but you're not gonna offend them by asking and saying that they'd be really good at a role. Okay, so those are kind of the things that I want you guys to think through as you're trying to organize around school board issues. This is how we bring people together. We have to have a place to do all of these things. Um, and now I'm going to give you a little real life experience. I'm going to stop sharing screen for a sec and kick it over to Julie. And she's going to talk to our guest, Anne, who has done this in real life. Anne, I just wanted to say thank you for coming this evening and uh, sharing with us. Um, so would you please introduce yourself uh, to the ladies and, and gentlemen and tell, tell them where you're from? Yes. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I've been on a call before, but it's been quite a while. Um, I'm Anne McGraw. I live in Williamson County, Tennessee, which is a suburb just south of Nashville. So super conservative, home of Marsha Blackburn, um, seventh wealthiest county in the whole country, um, very red for a very long time, but rapidly exponentially growing population explosion with, if you're familiar with Nashville, the past decade has been crazy. Um, and with that comes diversifying demographics, which has been very threatening to a lot of people. Um, so I was, um, I don't know, Julie, do you want me to go into the whole background of the group forming or do you want to wait for that? Uh, oh, well, I mean, we can start your group's name is Williamson strong, correct? Correct. Okay. And then, um, like you said, they started, uh, in 2014, which is before some of the, uh, friction has happened in other places, but, you know, tell us why this got formed. Yes, we were formed BT before Trump. <laughs> um, back in 2014, because our school board um, was taken over by the Tea Party. We have a 12 member public school board. It's a hugely, it's a huge um, public school population. Um, as you would imagine, a lot of dual educated parents, like very, you know, a lot of, a lot of headquarters in our county, like global headquarters. Um, and the school board without, because no one's paying attention to school board elections, got taken over by six Tea Partiers who were running on an anti-common core platform, um, which 
loosely translated meant that they were fighting Muslim indoctrination via our social studies curriculum. Um, and they won because no one shows up to vote. Um, so a handful of parents, and I was not one of them, um, there were four moms and that was it. And they were like, dude, <laughs> this is not good. And they started a Facebook page back in 2014, just to start being like, hey, yo, you guys need to start paying attention to what's going on with the school board. Um, they're trying to remove mentions of winter break and exchange it for Christmas. And they've just spent three months talking about this. And like, there's all this other stuff going on that we need to be talking about and removing art history books. And the Facebook page just started ballooning rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and I was one of the people that started cluing in. I had like a first grader at the time. I had no idea what the school board did. Um, long story short, parents quickly started organizing and getting pretty mad about what they were seeing and showing at the school board meetings for the first time ever. Um, I spoke at public comment in like December of 2014 and my very first school board meeting was terrified. Um, and fast forward six months, my school board member resigned because he basically was like, I did not sign up for this. Um, and I got his seat. So I knew nothing about any of this. And it was totally, you know, what Julie was saying. It was a little like, why not me moment. And so I ran the county commission appoints a seat and there were seven of us trying to get it. I had to run them to keep the seat. So I was on the school board for three years. We beat back a lot of the Tea Party candidates, resigned or moved and kind of drove them out. So they were the minority. Um, and then after three years, I was kind of done. Um, and so I didn't run again to keep it because I was really busy as a working mom, full-time working mom and with two kids and all this stuff. And Williamson Strong had grown and grown. And um, I was asked to take it over when in 2020, or was it 21? When did Moms for Liberty form? Was that 21? I'm losing track of time. I don't know. Um, I, I have trouble with the timing around COVID. <laughs> yeah, we had to reorganize and get, um, we kind of gone dormant. The group had gone dormant for a little while because it was relatively quiet for a few years there, at least in our neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. um, and when Moms for Liberty formed in our backyard, we were at the forefront of a lot of it um, because of the political connections in our county with Marsha's influence and some other people. Um, so we officially turned mm -hmm. our parent group um, which was literally just a Facebook page and a website into a pack and got really involved in fighting um, to get candidates onto the school board because we had a big election last year in 2022. Um, they went after our curriculum. Um, so that's kind of the backstory of how I am where I am and still kind of fighting the battles. And I'm going to drop a link here just in case anyone wants to read more about this after the meeting. This is a New Yorker profile on our group um, that we worked with them for a long time. So feel free to read. Well, I just want to ask this one question before we get into a little more of the meat of this. So prior to you becoming a school board member, were you an activist? Oh, God, no. No, <laughs> I was terrified. I knew, I knew nothing about politics. I didn't even really follow national. I mean, I followed national. I think I was just very normal. You know, mm -hmm. I was going about my life working at a, at a big company and felt socially conscious and aware, but I hadn't done anything of the sort ever. I didn't well, even I always know that, that. Well, I always ask that question because I, I want everybody on the call to know that they can do this. They can run for office. They can, you know, be on a local um, city council like I was or school board like you were. So, you know, and I was appointed uh, to my uh, seat. So I didn't know a whole lot, and especially about being in a rural area, but that's a that's a different day's topic. So let's talk about what has been happening with um, you guys and the fighting of Moms for Liberty. I I think that like a lot of other places, it seems like the subject matter has morphed. So like you started with the anti-Muslim, and then it went to CRT, and and just kind of the progression that all of us have probably seen across the country. Is mm -hmm. that pretty accurate? Yeah, absolutely. When the Moms for Liberty group um, first formed, and if you guys look up who the Moms for Liberty Williamson County spokesperson is, her name is Robin Steenman, and she's been like a national figurehead for their group. Um, mm -hmm. But she came out swinging, and at first it was about masks, and it was about parental rights. And then mm -hmm. it very quickly, like the national playbook shifted to CRT. Mm -hmm. um, and literally only because we'd been through this before, and a lot of the the names that we saw popping up because we have moles in their Facebook groups, which is really key. Um, 
we recognized what was happening. Um, and because we'd been through it before with the same group of people, the playbook fighting CRT and our curriculum was exactly, literally, what they had tried to do two years before with the anti-Muslim indoctrination. Mm -hmm. They were just a little bit more polished about it and had a bigger audience because they had gotten all these parents kind of on their sides for parental rights because they don't want their kids masked. Um, so that's really how they got their momentum initially. Um, and we were the ones, if anybody remembers them going after the Ruby Bridges curriculum, the first grade autobiography by Ruby Bridges and Ruby Bridges actually came on social media on Twitter and was like, you guys need to stop using my father's name and my name. And um, they tried to get our seahorses book removed um, because it was promoting gender fluidity. And it was like a first grade book about seahorses, you know, the, the males <laughs> carrying the babies. And so it was an elementary school curriculum um, that they were arguing against and they were organized. I mean, super organized. And I will tell you the only reason we were able to kind of fight back in a some somewhat cohesive manner is because we had already formed this group and we had this platform um, on Facebook really to mm -hmm. reach our audience. So I would encourage anybody, even if they're not coming for your school district yet, like as Julie said earlier, start now and start a group. Um, our Facebook group is public and it's very much like a news source for anything that's happening in the local school district. So people count on us. We're very pro-teacher, we're very, pro-public education, that's our angle always. Um, lately, it's been pro-student right to read and students' First Amendment rights, um, but we try to have been that constant voice of our very local, hyper-local school district news because no one else is covering that stuff. So that's how we've gained, we have like 5,500 followers now on a Facebook group. So when we do have calls to action, we're easy. it's easy to kind of mobilize and say, we need public commenters, we need you to send emails. So laying that groundwork was really important. So last year, it, they were fighting the curriculum wit and wisdom. Yes. Um, and so what, what is wit and wisdom and, and really quickly and, you know, why were they fighting that? So wit and wisdom is just, <coughs> excuse me, an elementary school ELA curriculum. Um, you know, the school district had gone through a curriculum review process. It's all set by policy. Um, done open community forums. Of course, nobody, nobody goes and reads the books. Um, and so it got implemented in fall of 2020. And that was the first year it was in the school district. Moms for Liberty started, they first organized in March of 21. And then they immediately started challenging the curriculum. So you can file like a formal complaint process to the district. Again, saying these books were inappropriate. They weren't age appropriate. Age appropriateness has been a huge angle for them from the beginning, whether it's curriculum or library books. Um, and it just, at least in our district, it triggers a huge process for a formal complaint. And they've got a formal review committee with made up of teachers and community members and school board members. And I think why we were, a lot of our messaging was regardless of the merit of their complaint, which everybody could see that it was ridiculous, mm -hmm. even if it wasn't, the amount of time that these book reviews and the curriculum reviews were taking from the district that were already underfunded, were already understaffed, teachers are already leaving in droves. That was really hitting home with parents. So we really leaned into that and been like, we really want our people spending time reviewing a seahorses book. Is that what our educators need to be focusing on right now? <laughs> and um, you know, we don't we can't hire chemistry teachers in the district, but we're worried about a seahorses book. Um, so wit and wisdom has been used for years. I think it's I think it's been used for. 12 years and like half the districts across the country, the stats were just unbelievable. And suddenly magically there's a problem um, that by the way, the complaint wasn't even filed by a current parent. Of course. Um, so, you know, it, again, same playbook. It yeah. only takes one person to file a complaint, but it triggers a lot of chaos. And so you guys won that round. And so then they came back with high school library books. Yes. So that was the latest one. Um, that's been going on for a year and a half. Um, there were seven books that were filed. Um, they complained about seven books in high school libraries that some of them had been in our high school libraries for over 20 years. Um, but they said they were age inappropriate and because they talked about things like rape or gay parents or things that um, you know they were very uncomfortable with students encountering because students are going to the library to look for those things. 
Um, <laughs> again, it was very common sense arguments and that's always been our drum. We are beating the drum constantly of not being reactive or inflammatory. It is just like common sense, pragmatism, like, okay, this book has been in the library for 18, 19 years and not a single parent has ever complained. You are also giving your high school students a phone with an internet browser. Like, can we be real here? Yes. Um, but it, it just dragged on and on. And we were able again to activate parents um, and get them to speak up and email board members. And it was touch and go. I mean, we have a lot of board members now that um, there's two Moms for Liberty candidates that are on the board. Mm -hmm. That's fun. And then there's like three or four more that are swing votes that we just never know. Um, and it, but it won by a vast majority to keep the books in the library. Um, I will tell you, any of you that are also in similar situations fighting book bans like this, um, a lot of the angles that they were using, the Moms for Liberty group um, were using to say these books need to be removed from the library or they need to have parent parental opt-ins. So your parents, mm -hmm. like they're removed from the shelves, but parents can opt their kids into the book, you know, into those books. Um, or, you know, only limited to 11th and 12th graders, for example, like all of these things have case law out there that have been mm -hmm. ruled unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. And we provided talking points to parents and just said, listen, the last thing any of these school board members want to do is be associated with a lawsuit. And right. we, were like, we have the local ACLU watching you. Here's the case laws, by the way, read up on all of these, what you're doing is unconstitutional go ahead and vote to remove them, but just know like we have people ready to sue. And a lot of the people before they voted, these swing votes, they said, we don't want to cost the taxpayer money because we know that there's going to be a lawsuit about this. Mm -hmm. So it was in the, we didn't know, it was in the end very effective to kind of place that fear of legal action, um, which would have happened. I mean, there would have been lawsuits if they'd removed these books, but no one wants to be associated with that. So right. that luckily worked. So what's next for you guys then? Because that was just last week that you won that one, right? Yes. Um, I don't know. It is like, you guys know this, I'm sure. It is just whack-a-mole. Um, it's exhausting. Um, right now, we're trying to work on helping improve the policies and processes around the book complaints. Um, so there's some examples across the country where a single complaint won't trigger this huge review process. The pro and the con is, thank God we had that, we have that policy in place. I would tell you, making sure that your school district's policies are very robust and that mm -hmm. they do not remove the books while they're reviewing a complaint was hugely important. Um, so luckily back in 2014, when these challenges first happened, they really updated a lot of the policies. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm happy to share links if anybody wants examples, but it's still very disruptive the way that it is now. Um, so we're trying to make it more um, more complicated for people to trigger this review process. Um, so really we're kind of leaning in, but we just don't know what's going to come next. And we have a very small, very small organizing group. Um, you know, Julie said delegate, but we are terrible at that. So there's about three or four of us behind the scenes and that's it. Um, so we took a very long break after the 2022 election because we were burnt, um, mm -hmm. but we're ready. You know, it's just, we don't know what's coming at us next. Um. And then I saw too that you guys are a media source for your um, area. So do you help the media with framing stories? And We do a lot behind the scenes. <laughs> we build up a lot of relationships with local reporters who will come to us for insights or background, um, even quotes. We have organized a few local protests. Um, there was some book banning legislature up at the state capitol sometime last year and we quickly organized a protest. And then we, trigger, we try to get the media to cover those things. But yeah, I would say um, that has not been, that has not been as effective. I think it's kind of the Facebook communications, which I am the, I'm the world, I hate Facebook beyond words, but <laughs> for organizing this demographic of people, it's, there's no replacement for it, at least mm -hmm. not right now. Mm -hmm. so. So if you could give one piece of advice to the folks here on this call, what would it be? I would say um, start organizing before you need to. Um, and well, I'll say three things. Start organizing before you need to and get people paying attention. Um, get them tuned into what the school board does and what their roles are and who's on it. Um, try to keep your cool. 
So once you lose people's trust, it's really hard to build it back up. So trying to stay that unbiased, you know, non-inflammatory, like contributing to the chaos, people, at least where I am, really shy away from that. They don't want the drama. They don't want it to be political. They like the nonpartisan public school angle. Um, and there have been times on Facebook where I've gotten really upset about something and kind of written something before I should have. And not even bad, but being human and going back and apologizing and being like, listen, I was really upset and I was heated. <laughs> and the comments on posts like that are just like, oh my God, I'm so glad there's a human behind this. You know, we get upset too. Um, so be real, but try to be, try to be professional. Pretend like it's your business environment as much as you can. Because mm -hmm. it is. I mean, at the end of the day, there's very big business involved in this, in this privatization movement, which is what's driving all of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess third, as much as you can get to know your local legislature, le local legislators, um, whether it's hyper local, like on the city council level, or we have like city aldermen, county commissioners, and at the state, um, so much of what we're doing is just fighting against the state because Tennessee is not good yep. <laughs> right now um i live so, in ohio and we have a super majority on the other side so we understand <laughs> yeah it's really um it can feel very hopeless and pointless at times and trying not to let yourself get down but just knowing like um was said they do not like being called out and they're not used to it um so applying the same sort of pressure up at the state level um you know, you kind of have to figure out how to hit both angles, but you, you also have to, you can't get too hyper-focused. You also kind of have to look at who's ultimately making the laws that are driving your district to do what they're doing because they work really tightly together. Yeah. Well, I just, I want to thank you for sharing. Um, I want to thank you for being transparent and, you know, showing folks that, you know, you're just a regular person, you know, you got on school board. Now you're not on that, but you're running this group. And, you know, and you have to, you know, do carpool and stuff like everybody else and in sports and all that. So, you know, I just, I really always want to share how, you know, we are all regular moms that are, you know, doing these kinds of things, you know, that we don't have, you know, superhero capes and all that other good stuff. I mean, we, you know, pretend we do, but we, <laughs> we you don't know. really have them. <laughs> I would say too, I think it's really important to emphasize with groups like this, um, even if you yourself don't feel comfortable running for office, it is just as, if not more important to help with the campaign. So yes. helping be a campaign manager or a treasurer or a communications mm -hmm. person, um, that's why people don't do this is because they feel like they have no support network and that's very behind the scenes, but super critical. So there's so many ways to help local candidates without you being the face and all that goes with it. Um, so I'd really encourage you to be a part of that um, when it comes time in your in your area, because that, that makes all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. It does. All right, well, thank you. And I'm gonna kick this back over to Julie for the rest of our training. Okay, I was just removing them from the spotlight. I'm gonna share screen again, and we will go back to the training. All right, let me get to the right screen. Okay, so let's talk about showing up at school board. Let's talk about book bans directly and let's talk about how you can get attention around all of this. So number one, why do you need to show up at school board meetings? Because the opposition is small. They are small, they are the minority in almost everywhere, mainstream parents. We're gonna show you some statistics in a second. Do not like book bans, but they are very loud and they make a lot of noise. So if you don't show up, then they are the only voice in the room. It's also really important that your community sees um, that there are people standing up for common sense and are trying to oppose this. Um, and not just, so basically you're not just there to trying to influence your school board, you're also trying to influence your community because you wanna be able to share this information. You want to be able to see other people in the room seeing this. Um, most school board meetings are recorded. A lot of people sometimes do watch those recordings. So. You know, definitely you are speaking um, to influence the school board, but you're also speaking to make sure your community in a broader sense hears what's going on and is seeing um, that, hey, it's not just these loud people. There are people who feel like me who are up there. So what are some ways this if this is happening in your community or you see it coming? Maybe someone's proposed a ban. Maybe there's just like people chattering at school board or you're seeing things on social media. Here's what you can do to try to help like make your voice heard with your school board members. 
you know, a contact campaign. So whether it's email, letter writing, phone calls, whatever really works best for you, do it. I had a woman come to this training and they had a book ban starting. She got a hundred people together. They made like a hundred phone calls to her school board. Guys, that overwhelmed the school board. They don't get phone calls. <laughs> so a hundred phone calls really overwhelmed it and they they defeated the book ban. And she came back and told me all about it. She was super excited. So um, so whatever you're doing in that, you know, make it, here's the my one tip though. You need to make it easy. If you just get into your Facebook group and say, hey, let's all call school board or all let, let's all send an email. They won't do it. Um, you need a little handholding here. You need to give them the phone numbers or the email addresses. If you're going to send an email, give them a draft, like a sample, show them what you sent or give them like a, a template. You don't want to all send the exact same email, but maybe give them a little bit of um, guidance as to what to say, because people are, are intimidated to contact school mem- um, elected officials, even at like school board level. So definitely help people do that. And then like post when you do it and encourage, you know, fear of missing out, make it make it seem like what the cool kids are doing is contacting their school board. Um, and then the other thing is social media campaign. So you definitely need to get the word out about what's going on, especially if these book bans are happening or they're attempting um, to be done in your community. So you want to make sure um, other people are aware. So maybe this is a great way to delegate. Somebody can who's good at social media can take charge on that. And this is to inform your community, to raise awareness, because people are moving around with their life, driving kids to practice, going to work, doing household stuff, not necessarily dialed into this. So whether it is members of your group making personal posts on their Facebook pages about what's going on, taking videos or clips from school board meetings. Um, There's a group here in Cincinnati that has a TikTok account. They have some extremists on their school board, and they will just put out TikTok videos of the kind of extreme things they say and share those around. Um, Highlight articles if you get covered in the news. Anything you can do to get the word out through Facebook pages, through personal Facebook pages, any of that way. Um, Social media, Twitter. You know, if there are people in your community following Twitter, um, tag local politicians, local school boards, local, you know, anybody of influence. Get your members retweeting that teach your members how to use Twitter. Not everybody knows how to do that. So it's a good thing to get people together and teach them um, how to do that and how to spread things on social media. Make it fun, you know, cool graphics, fun graphics, catch attention, use a hashtag, um, but do, do something to get that word out on social media to your community. And then of course you actually need to go to the meetings, but you don't want to just say, all right, again, Facebook, we're going to go to the meeting tonight. You kind of want to organize a little bit around that. Maybe there's a, you know, an event in Facebook where people can sign up. I personally like to send around like a sign up genius because you capture people's emails in <laughs> um, and you can keep emailing them after that. With Facebook, it's kind of hit or miss. You never know whether they're going to see it or not, right? Facebook makes that decision for you. Um, so sign up genius is a good way to kind of get that data and then be able to keep being in contact with people. And when you go to a meeting, you want to kind of make sure that like they know you're there together. So, you know, if you're all going to talk about a book brand that's happening, maybe you wear the same color shirts, maybe you have little signs or something just to show that this group is all here together. My one one person said they printed off stickers and then people just walked in and slapped on a sticker. That way it was easy. You could come from work, put on a sticker. You don't have to change clothes or anything like that. It was just a good way to show unity. And then the last thing is um, you need to, you know, figure out who's speaking. Don't just assume people are going to stand up there. You need to, again, organize that as well. Who is speaking? What are all the angles you want to hit? What are all the talking points you want to make sure are being said? And make sure someone's actually covering all of those. Um, Maybe have a practice session for them. You never know that, you know, if some people are not great at public speaking or are scared to do that. And then definitely very important is to familiarize yourself with the procedures of your school board meeting. Don't just show up and assume, cool, we're going to speak. Some people have to sign up the day before. There's a limited number of people who can speak. How long can you speak? You don't want to have this amazing five-minute speech and get cut off at three minutes. Um, So just kind of understand what the rules are so that you don't walk in and find out that you really actually are not going to be effective or not even going to be able to speak. And then... This is what I was talking about, about being confident. So like I said, they are a loud vocal minority. They might get press coverage. They might be like all over social media. You are the majority. 87% of people do not support book bans. Um, So 
this is true across the board. You are definitely in the majority. You do not see political issues like this at 87%. 83% do not support banning books critical of U.S. history. Um, so again, just being confident and when you're in there speaking that to know that most people are on your side on this issue. And they're probably gonna be happy to see you're standing up for it. So when you get to school board, how do you wanna like present yourself? What do you wanna think through with speaking? So number one, introduce yourself and make your connection to the community known because what we found out, and this is true, we had a, an issue around out of school, book, not school, um, sorry, not around book bans in my community, but about our, our abortion at the local level. And they bust in people from Wisconsin. I'm not kidding. So the people would stand up and say, I'm from Wisconsin. I'm in Cincinnati, y'all. Do you know how far that is? Um, and so there are a lot of people coming in who do not live in your community. Maybe they live, you know, three towns over, but they are a lot of people who are going to come and speak are being bussed in or brought in. So show your connection. You know, I have two kids in the school. I have grandkids here. I've lived here for 15 years. You don't have to have kids in the school to be involved. You're a community member. You can care. Just show your connection to the community. Maybe you have a business there. Thank your school board members for their hard work. This goes back to what Ann said. We're cordial. We are the calm, polite people representing mainstream parents. And then share your perspective. So when you're starting to think about what you want to say, just think, why do you care? Like, why are you up here speaking? What do you care about? Sharing your personal stories. You know, how is this impacting you, your child, your friends? What are you worried about if this book ban passes, these books are taken off the shelf? Data is great. Good to share some of that. Kind of boring. People here, it goes in one stories that are impact. So if you can do that, you know, is Julie going in and out for people? Yeah. Okay. Julie, you're going in yes. and out. In fact, you're frozen. So, oh. am I back now? Yes. Okay. I just got the internet unstable message. So, okay. Hopefully, you heard some of that. I'm going to go to the next slide because I don't know where I got cut off. Um, a couple other tips when you're making your presentation. Um, don't repeat disinformation. So there are a lot of people who hear things like these extremists are talking about teachers being groomers and indoctrinating kids. Don't get up in your speech and say, teachers are not indoctrinating, teachers are not groomers, because this is actually counterproductive. What people remember is the salacious charge. Even though you're trying to discount it, two weeks later, they're going to be like, I heard something about teachers grooming or indoctrinating. So repeating the disinformation is not the way to go. Just talk about what you want your message to be. You know, students should have learned accurate history. They shouldn't learn fairy tales. We need to prepare them for the future. Students should all feel welcome and accepted. They should see themselves in the curriculum. Um, don't, don't buy into the right wing talking points or repeat them. It's not gonna be helpful, even though it's very tempting. Um, and the other thing, too, is defining the opposition. Again, we want to appeal to mainstream parents. There's a lot of disinformation out there. So there are a lot of parents out there who probably believe some of this and they're not bad people. <laughs> they are, you know, they're just scared because they hear stuff and they don't know it's wrong. So we don't want to pit them against us and turn them, um, you know, turn them against us. So it's good to have someone to be kind of defined as like the villain in this, but it should not be the other parents. So it's fine to say there are a few extremists in our community who are doing this. Maybe there's a school board member who's leading the charge, you know, which I think you know, Anne says on her school board, there are. So that's okay. Name them. Like they, they're doing this. Don't say like, if you're here and you oppose this measure, you know, you're know you a terrible person because there are people there who probably are confused and don't really understand the measure. And if you call them out that way, you know what you're doing? You're solidifying them with the other side because they're like, man, those people are calling me out. Same thing if you blame like a political party, um, you know, it's fine to say extremist politicians or right wing politicians, but there may be some people in there who identify with that party or a particular group and you're alienating them. So it's really important to kind of like not and who you how you define the opposition. So just think that through when you're making your speech as well. So these are our book ban talking points. I will share these with you. So I'm not going to go into like great detail on all of them. Um, there, but there's so many great things, you know, call out this stuff. Like Anne was talking about, you're banning books about like Rosa Parks. Come on. I mean, like nobody agrees with that. 
Um, everyone deserves to have freedom to make decisions for their kids. You can make decisions for your kids. You don't get to decide what I get to do or what my children should do. You know, patriotism, this isn't patriotic. This is against everything our constitution stands for. Um, all of this stuff, mom expertise. We know you ban books. Kids are going to go look for them. Um, so definitely I will send these to you so you can incorporate this in, into anything you want to use if you're making speeches before your school board. Um, and then we want to share some ideas. So not only going to speak at your school board, but we talked about raising awareness in your community. So how are some ways that you might be thinking outside the box to kind of raise, um, get people's attention and what's going on? And I'm going to kick it over to Julie for this. So, so thinking out the box is uh, one of my favorite things, actually, um, and I'll actually incorporate a question that someone had um, in the chat, too. Someone asked in the chat, um, what if you are not a parent? One of the things I, I like about Think Outside the Box is you can form a grandma brigade or an auntie brigade. You know, you are a taxpayer in that school district, so you have every right to be at that school board meeting and speaking out on, you know, what they're doing that you know, it with these bans, um, especially for literature we've had in our school districts for years and years. Um, holding a positive event, um, supporting the teachers, um, a school supply drive, passing out info on the bans. You know, I bet a lot of parents don't even know this is going on because a lot of parents are, you know, just, you know, trying to get through the busy day to day and get their kids to school and to practice and home and fed and all of those things. And so some of them may not even know. You can sign a big thank you card for your teachers, your librarians, or even your school board members that are um, very supportive and helping fight back. Um, you can pass out banned books at meetings. You can stock those little libraries that they have around in places with banned books. Um, I, know, I saw in that there's been a lot of great information in the chat, and one of them was having students start banned book clubs um, or having the students speak out. Um, highlight books that are being banned on social media and share the subject and stories and awards that they've won. You know, these are mostly award-winning books that they're trying to do this with. Um, you can have yard signs to support your side or the students, you know, things like You Belong, wear t-shirts with the banned authors, um, do sidewalk talk messages, um, change your profile pictures to you holding banned books, and you can also hold a read-in of banned books, which is something that I cannot believe it's been two years we've done this, but it was two years ago. We did a read-in for accurate education at the state school board here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and we had, um, uh, it was a rainy day for two hours that we were out there in the rain. We did have opposition show up. They were loud, obnoxious, shoving and all that. And we were sitting quietly reading books by um, authors of color. And it was very effective. We got a lot of great uh, earned media because we were the calm people in the, you know, was outside, but the calm people in the room, if you will. You know, we, we did not look, you know, like they did um, in, in terms of, you know, just being so wild and outlandish. And some folks even brought their kids um, and, you know, teach truth. You see these folks here, these pictures here. It was really very effective. We still had some issues with our school, our state school board and with the governor, um, unfortunately. However, um, this day it, it was, I felt like we had a little bit of a triumph. Great, all right, so this is our final thoughts. Again, if you have questions, drop them in the chat. We'll try to answer those in the last 10 minutes or so. So just final thoughts. Remember, we kind of said this already, keep a calm face. <laughs> Don't lose your temper if you can't help it. I know Anne says she's lost her temper on Facebook and apologized. You know what? We're all human. It's good to show that we're all human. Um, but you want to be the calm people in the room, right? If someone's watching that feed from the meeting later, you want the other side to look like the screaming people who aren't making any sense. And you want to be the calm people. People are going to be like, I want to join that side. You know, that's what you want to look like. Um, reach out, support teachers and librarians because they have it rough right now. So they need to know that there's allies behind them. Um, if that makes all the difference, could just to even speak up and uh, let them know that you care. Uh, learn the book review process at your school. I did not know there was a book review process till I started doing this work. So Anne touched on this, but a lot of schools, most should have a policy. So if someone did want to challenge a book, um, usually it's like you need to show you read the book, you need to say why you're challenging it, and it's supposed to go to a committee, it's supposed to stay on the shelf while it's being reviewed. 
um, committee makes recommendations to the school board. What we're finding is that a lot of schools are not following their policy. Um, so the, you know, just there's a breakdown there. So know the policy so that you can come back and talk about that um, it, with, at, at your school board. And maybe there's some legal liability there, like Ann mentioned, you know, there might be something you can talk to about, a lawyer about, like if your school is not following the policy. The other thing you can do is also watch other school districts in your area to prepare. So maybe it's not happening near at your school district, but it's happening a couple of districts over. Um, which means it's probably coming to you. So, you know, go to the school board meetings, watch the recordings of the school board meetings, because let me give you a hint. Um, what they're saying and doing and attacking is a playbook. So it's if it's doing it in this district, they're going to do it in your district. So you can be prepared <laughs> when it comes to you. You'll know what they're going to say and you can have talking points ready to go to get up and um, push back on that. All right. You got this. All this advice, we will send you the deck and the talking points um, probably tomorrow. Um, so check your email for that. I'm going to stop sharing and we'll see if there was any questions that Julie thinks we should be answering from the chat. Yes. So you already answered the one about recordings. Um, someone um, wanted to know if there was some uh, resource somewhere on info on the lawsuits when books are removed. Um, like, so I know that, Ann, you had mentioned something about the threat was out there. You guys didn't actually have to do it, but has someone done it uh, somewhere that you know of? Penn America. I think I dropped the link in. I usually go to Penn because they have so many resources. Um, and usually I'll just Google. And But Penn has the, kind of a bank of specific FAQs about book challenges and what they mean. Um, and they usually link out to the specific cases that are relative to that to that language. And then someone asked if the goal was to destroy public schools. And I would say, yes, it is that goal. Yes. That is their goal. Um, and then the other question um, someone had, this is the last one. Um, if there were any suggestions on what to do when you have a skittish um, superintendent, some of the superintendents are scared to stand and speak out because they're afraid that you know they'll lose their jobs. That's a I tough mean, my take on that would be that <laughs> it's not your superintendent's job to be speaking out and being, you know, the forefront of the on either side of it, really. They should be listening to both sides and just giving their recommendation to the board on how they should vote. That's in the mm -hmm. best interest of the district. If they won't even meet with you, um, I would be publicly calling them out for that, being like they're not listening to both sides of these issues. And that feels unfair and biased and I'm trying to present all the facts, um, but usually finding a board member that's an ally, they almost always have, you know, that audience with the superintendent. So getting the board members to do that work for you is very, very effective. Yeah, I know, like in Ohio, the superintendent kind of makes the recommendations and, you know, to the to the board. Um, so and I know sometimes they try to play placate parents on all sides with um, with that, but I, I definitely think they listen when you go to the school board meetings, I would email them as well. I would get people to email them. So maybe they see that the community really is on the side of mainstream parents on this and they can be influenced just as like anybody else that there's this loud group that's there every week. And if they don't hear from anybody else, you know, they, that makes them, gives them more anxiety, um, especially if they're dealing with an extremist school board. So that's hard because people do care about their jobs, but you wish people would just stand up for what's right. But I, I know that's hard. Um, but I think that's what I would do would be just to show that most of the community is on your side on this issue. And we have with teachers um, heard um, a suggestion uh, teachers uh, swapping districts. So if you don't feel comfortable talking in the district where you teach, go speak in a neighboring district, you know, about how important the books that are there that are attempting to be banned are to your curriculum, your classroom, you know, that kind of thing, or to the kids in general. Um, so that's also another idea. Um, but that's the first time somebody's asked about the superintendent. So that was an uh, interesting question. Um, and back to the resources, I will send you guys a list of resources as well. So like Penn America, 100%, every library is another group that you can um, look into. There's a group in Florida called Florida Freedom to Read, who are a bunch of moms who are just an amazing <laughs> group down there. Um, yeah. So anyways, there's a lot of, of different uh, places. Uh, Freedom Fight 
freedom fighters. I think that's their name, but it's like freedom with read instead of free in that uh, she was started by a librarian in Texas. So there's a bunch, I will send you links to those. You can always find those kind of resources, the American Library Association. And somebody okay. said, ask if uh, you can read an active teacher statement as well. Um, I know one time uh, when I, the last time I actually spoke at a school board meeting um, and my children are grown, my youngest is 30. Um, and this was just like a year and a half ago or so, um, but there were folks who weren't comfortable actually speaking. And so other folks were reading their testimony. So, you know, there's always a way to get the information out. Um, and that's again, where some of that thinking outside the box, you know, comes in handy. I will say too, having new faces, new names that our parents show up at different school board meetings, hugely impactful. If it's the same people every time, has its value for sure for consistency, like, hey, I'm here again, still, still talking to you about this. Mm -hmm. But then if you just get, you know, the average Jane to show up and she's like, I don't know why I'm here. I'm kind of irritated. I've spent my night doing this, but this is how upset I am about what you're trying to do to my kids' schools. Mm -hmm. um, seeing new faces always seems to have, they really are listening hard when that happens. And students. Students, <laughs> yes, students God. God bless there. the teenagers, yes. Yeah, God, God bless the students. I'm trying hard to get a panel together of some student just to come and speak to all of us about like, these are students who are like <laughs> organizing, like they give me hope for the future. Or, like they're gonna, they're gonna save the world. So hoping yes. to get them to come and speak. But yeah, students, this is how it's impacting them directly is pretty hard hitting testimony. And again, that goes back to the, not statistics, like those personal stories. And that's what's really gonna make an impact. Mm -hmm. That's it, right. Julie. Okay. All right. Well, Anne, thank you so much. We really appreciate you sharing all of that wonderful information. Um, glad to have you down there doing that work in Tennessee. Everybody else, you can do it too. <laughs> um, and we thank you. And please look for an email from me tomorrow morning. It's just going to take our system that long to catch up. So I know who's here tonight so I can email you. Um, so go everyone have a good rest of your night and have a wonderful 4th of July weekend. Thank we'll you, you so soon. much. Bye.